So at some point this afternoon, the unseen will become seen. In just a few hours, all the hidden boxes in my house, wrapped in colorful paper, will be unwrapped in a matter of mere seconds, as papers thrown around the room, and that which is hidden within will be revealed. For several weeks now, the big discussion around our house has been the big five. Which friends did Bailey want to invite to her birthday party? What kind of cake did Bailey want to eat at her birthday party? But perhaps most importantly, what presents did Bailey want for her birthday? Now, if you know me well enough, you would guess correctly that gifts were bought several weeks ago. I don't like waiting to the last minute and then having to rush. In fact, the big gift for today was actually purchased six months ago. Allison and I found a really good deal and we couldn't pass it up, so for six months it's been hidden away. This growing stash of gifts has been secreted away in one of my hiding spots, and I will not mention where it is because my son was waiting for me to reveal that, and I'm not telling him. But today, these unseen gifts will become seen. That which has existed in secret in my house will come into light, which is kind of the point of birthday gifts, right? What good is a gift that's never opened? And we've probably all had that oops moment where weeks or months later we discover the Christmas or birthday present hiding in the back of the closet that we never gifted. And we say, well, it really didn't serve its purpose. It never was revealed. Gifts are meant to move from the unseen to the seen, to shift from the hidden and secret to the fully known. And there's usually a sense of anticipation and excitement, right? This afternoon, as Bailey opens her gifts, I'm excited to see this process unfold. But what about the other hidden, unseen things in our lives? The things that we want to keep hidden, do they matter if no one sees them? And this is kind of the question that Numbers chapter 5 begins to address for us today. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to open up to Numbers chapter 5. So far, in the first four chapters, the book of Numbers has focused around, well, numbers, right? We counted the fighting men of Israel. Uh, There was the counting of the Levite males, the counting of the Israelite males, the counting of the Levites of working age, and and counting and counting and counting. In and around all of the counting, all of the numbers, we encountered God's faithfulness, God's call to order, God's passion for redeeming, and God's holiness. But today, as we turn to Numbers chapter 5, there are no numbers, which might make some of us very happy until you actually go and read the chapter. Because instead of counting, we find three sections addressing three seemingly unrelated areas, and quite frankly, as we read them, some of it makes us squirm a bit. And so with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and read it. All right. The chapter opens up in Numbers chapter 5. The first section is verses 1 through 5. And it says, The Lord said to Moses, Command the Israelites to send away from the camp anyone who has a defiling skin disease or a discharge of any kind, who is ceremonially unclean because of a dead body. Send away male and female alike. Send them outside the camp so they will not defile their camp where I dwell among them. The Israelites did so. They sent them outside the camp. They did just as the Lord had instructed Moses. Now, each of these three sections we're going to look at today begin with the same words. Each time it begins with, the Lord said to Moses, which again reminds us that the real theme of this book is God speaking. God speaking in the wilderness. God speaks to Moses. Moses repeats it to the people. And he writes it down for us today. In this first area of concern, God gives some instructions for physical issues. Anyone with a defiling skin disease, uh, some translations might use the word leprosy, it's this wide area of skin issues, right? Anyone with a discharge coming out of their body, blood, pus, all that kind of fun stuff. And anyone who's been near a dead, decaying corpse, if that's you, you need to leave the camp and go outside it. Why? Well, from our modern understanding of medical science, a lot of this makes sense, right? They're living in close quarters, in hot, sweaty, desert environments. Any kind of contagious disease would spread quickly, leading to great harm to the community. 
And so these people with possible infections need to be isolated quickly. One commentator I was reading this week speculates that these instructions about sending those who are infected outside of the camp was actually the foundation or the origin for our modern concept of a hospital. Now here in this passage, there's no specifics mentioned about a caretaker or any kind of healers going outside the camp. But the groundwork does seem to be being laid where God says, hey, take those who are sick and move them outside away from everyone else where they can hopefully be healed. Now, of course, the Israelites would not have understood the science behind germs and the spread of infection. But in this, God provides a second and perhaps more meaningful reason for isolating the sick. In verse 3, he says, I dwell among them. I dwell with you. Remember, as we saw the camp being laid out in the past weeks, who is at the physical center of the camp? God dwells in the tabernacle right in the middle of their camp. We've heard repeatedly in the first four chapters about the care needed in approaching the tabernacle, in approaching God, that only the priest can enter the sanctuary in God's presence, that only the Levites can be around the tabernacle in the camp. But even those in the rest of the camp need to consider their purity in being near God's presence. This whole chapter addresses the need to keep the camp clean and free from sin. Not just sinful behavior, but also the effects of living in a sinful, fallen world. So in this case, disease and illness, their physical purity. Remember, the Israelites at this point are still camped out at Mount Sinai. Five chapters in, they have not left the mountain yet, but they're getting ready to leave the mountain behind and head towards the promised land. They're preparing to go from here to there. And so far, God is reminding them again and again and again of His holiness. How do we live in the presence of, holy, of a holy God? It's not just about keeping one's distance from the tabernacle, but keeping the physical purity and health of the entire camp is essential. Now, there are practical reasons, again, the spread of infection and disease, but there are spiritual reasons, keeping the camp holy because God himself dwells with them. Now, these verses can kind of begin to leave us thinking that God wants to get rid of us if we're sick. God says, I want you to put them out of the camp. If you're not a perfect specimen of humanity, we're going to be outcasted to the periphery, to the, the outskirts. But those outside the camp were still a vital part of the community. Once their physical condition changed and was healed, they were welcome to come back in. I think this is seen even more strikingly when we consider the New Testament and we look at the stories of Jesus. Because Jesus interacts with each of these three categories. In Matthew chapter 8, we read a man with leprosy. This is exactly what uh, X, or Numbers 5 is talking about. A man with leprosy came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus re reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. In John chapter 8, we read, A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding, this bodily discharge for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Immediately after this story, we have another story where Jesus was still speaking. Someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. He said, Your daughter is dead. But Jesus took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. And then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. We see Jesus touching the leper, Jesus touching the bleeding woman, Jesus touching the dead. And time and time again, he's restoring wholeness and life. And what we begin to realize, especially as we look at the story of Jesus, is that God doesn't outcast those with physical ailments, but he meets them in the midst of them. And so in this first section, God says, you need to be careful about how you are physically pure. Are you healthy in my midst? And the chapter continues by jumping to another topic altogether, but equally related. In Numbers chapter 5, we start at verse 5. Again, the Lord said to Moses, 
say to the Israelites, any man or woman who wrongs another in any way and so is unfaithful to the Lord is guilty and must confess the sin they have committed. They must make full restitution for the wrong they have done, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it, to all, to, give it all to the person they have wronged. Here, the Lord speaks to Moses again and moves from this idea of physical purity to ethical purity. The specific issues addressed in this section uh, really relate to when one person wrongs another, and the underlying details revolve around material items. If you steal something, or if you break something that does not belong to you, what happens? Again, God is dwelling in their midst. He's at the center of their camp. How they treat one another is vital to the community health and their witness to the world. Now, I think it's easy, we've all done it at times, to think that an ethical gray area isn't that big of a deal. If I cheat here, if I fudge that over there, who is going to know? Who is it really going to hurt? And yet here God outlines the effects of these ethical and moral failures. He says, when you do these things, you damage your neighbor, you grieve the heart of God, and we defile ourselves. He says there's a threefold impact to our sin. We often think it's, you know, if no one knows about it, if it's an ethical gray area that no one sees, it's just about me, right? But sin affects my community, and sin affects God. And in this section, God gives instructions about how are we to address any ethical or moral failure. It's not just supposed to be swept under the rug. He says it needs to be confessed. It needs to be addressed. The offender needs to confess what they've done, and then they need to make restitution to the one they've offended. And in the specifics here, God will actually say you need to add a 20% penalty to amend the situation. This section is strikingly specific and vague at the same time, at least how I, my mind processes it. For example, if I were to steal $100 from Rick Mayhews, I need to confess and then pay him $120 back. It's very clear. If I stole a sheep from him and I ate it for dinner, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to give him 1.2 sheep back. Or, and this is why I mentioned him by name, because I was thinking if I took his Corvette without permission, how do I repair 120% of the dents that I would probably most definitely leave in the Corvette? God is very specific here, but it's a little hard to apply at times. And so the leaders of Israel had to work through the specifics case to case, but the principle being established was very clear. God cares about the moral and ethical purity of the community. Are you being honest? Right? Are you treating one another well? Now, as we're looking at these two sections so far, you might be processing all of this and wondering, well, how does this relate to the unseen? That's where we started. These physical ailments are visible, right? The moral issues were seen and to be addressed. As God speaks to Moses about these things, they sound very seen, very visible. If this is you, here's what you need to do. But stop and think about it a little bit more. We realize they may not be as visible as we'd immediately assume. If I have a skin disease on my elbow, all I have to do is roll down my sleeve Who's going to know about it? The bleeding woman in Luke chapter 8. Who really would know what's going on behind the scenes in her life? If I was around a dead animal by myself, as long as I don't tell you about it, who really knows? Likewise, I can come up with a whole list of moral areas that you would never know what I did. And if you don't know, why do I need to confess it? Why do I have to address it? If I can get away with it, and no one knows, what's the harm? But God was dwelling with them. As he says, do this because I dwell in your midst. God is holy, and God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. God is holy, and he sees the unseen. These areas of concern could have easily been hidden in many cases. 
yet they could never be hidden from God. He cares about our physical purity. He cares about our moral purity. He is holy and pure. A few months prior to these verses being, these words being given to Moses in Leviticus 19, the Lord said to Moses then, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, you need to be holy. Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. God calls them to this purity spiritually or physically and morally. And in the third, third section, he's going to call them to relational purity, specifically in the case of their marriages, because he is holy. I dwell in your midst. I am holy. You need to be holy in your bodies, in your minds, and in your relationships. So we come to the third section. It's Numbers chapter 5, starting at verse 11. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, If a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him, so that another man has sexual relations with her, and this is hidden from her husband, and her impurity is undetected, since there was no witness against her and she has not been caught in the act. And if feelings of jealousy come over her husband and he suspects his wife and she is impure, or if he is jealous and suspects her even though she is not impure, then he is to take his wife to the priest. The specifics in this section revolve around a husband who has an unfaithful wife, but there's no proof of her unfaithfulness. In other words, it's unseen. Or it also revolves around the husband who has a spirit of jealousy and is accusing his wife of her unfaithfulness, but she's not unfaithful. This is by far the longest section of the three, and to be honest, at first it feels a bit one-sided. Wives, how do you feel about your husbands accusing you of infidelity, but there's no reciprocal given for you to address your husband? Marital purity is of utmost importance to God. Again, he dwells in their midst. Their purity represents his holiness. He cares about our relational purity. It feels a bit one-sided, though. However, given the culture of the day, these instructions are actually extremely protective of the wives involved. Typically, if a husband suspected his wife of cheating, again, with no proof, he just is jealous, he feels like she's treated him wrong, he could simply deal with the issue himself. He could divorce her, he could beat her, he could probably kill her. But what if she was innocent? What if he's the one who's in sin? He's jealous, right? So God speaks into this and he says, if one spouse is in sin, either she has been unfaithful or he's in sin because he's jealous. In either way, come to the priest. There's not a free license given to the husband to do as he wants. That would lead to sin one way or another. There's not an out given to the wife if she is indeed unfaithful. If it was unseen, it will be seen by God. And so the instructions are, come to the priest. So the husband is to bring his wife to the priest, and then we get a really obscure kind of ritual here, verse 16. The priest shall bring her, the wife, and have her stand before the Lord. Then he shall take some holy water in a clay jar and put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. After the priest has had the woman stand before the Lord, he shall loosen her hair and place in her hands the rem reminder offering, the grain offering for jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water that brings a curse. Then the priest shall put the woman under oath and say to her, If no other man has had sexual relations with you, and you have not gone astray and have become impure while you were married to your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. But if you have gone astray while, your husband, while married to your husband, and you have made yourself impure by having sexual relations with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the woman under this curse, may the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people, when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. Then the woman is to say, Amen, so be it. Really fun, right? The priest is to take the wife and have her stand before the tabernacle. Now, that alone should give us alarm if she's guilty. We've read over and over again, no one is to approach the tabernacle because of this holiness issue. 
lest they die, right? If she is in sin and she's trying to hide her sin, what do you think could happen in this moment? That alone should maybe make us think through our actions. But if she's innocent and her husband is the one in sin, she can only be vindicated at this point. So then God outlines this really obscure ritual where holy water is mixed with dust from the tabernacle floor, which sounds really German-fested to us, doesn't it? But again, in this mindset, the, the tabernacle is holy. And so in other words, it's, it's holy dust. So it's holy water with holy dust mixed into it, okay? Then the priest will state this oath. If the woman has been unfaithful, may this holy water she's about to drink curse her. The holy water will come in contact with her sin. If she's innocent, this holy water will have no effect. She then expresses her verbal consent to the oath. And then the section goes on to say that the priest is going to write out these words on a scroll. And when the ink dries, he scrapes the ink into the drink, into the water, and then she drinks it. If she's guilty, it will lead to issues in her reproductive system. If she's innocent, nothing will happen. And again, by the end of reading this ritual, we feel a bit uncomfortable. It fe seems unfair. It seems a bit one-sided until we kind of think about the culture of the day. Many cultures then and, and even later into history had these things, these trials by ordeal, okay? If you were suspected of a crime, you would do this thing to prove your innocence. You were guilty unless you were proven otherwise. Um, one example that was common throughout history is, uh, you're guilty, we think you're guilty of this sin, so take your hand, stick it in the boiling water, and if you pull your hand out and you're unburned, well, you're innocent. How do you think that turned out 99.99% of the time? The Salem witch trials were a great example of this. We think you're a witch, so you're guilty of that until proven otherwise. We're going to tie you up, throw you in the lake, and if you float, you're good to go. You were guilty until proven innocent, yet here God tells them to work on the assumption of innocence until proven guilty. If she is innocent, she has nothing to fear. She stands before the tabernacle and drinks. It's water, dust, and ink. It's not the most appealing drink, but there's nothing really dangerous in it. Also, in addition to all of the, that, the results of this ordeal, this test, do you notice that they're not immediate? Nothing happens at the end of this. She's going to drink it, and she goes home with her husband, and they wait. Time does a lot of things as we wait upon results. Anyone who has sat in a hospital waiting room can attest to this. We use this time to process and reflect. Sometimes we make resolutions. And so as, as they go home together, as the hours and days go by with no effect, the husband is forced to wrestle with his jealousy. What have I done? Who am I that I would accuse my wife of these things? Or, as the hours and the days go by, the guilty wife who knows what she's done is now battling with her guilt. This ordeal creates space for remorse and reflection and confession. It creates time to kind of reflect on what has been done and who is in sin. It might offend our modern understanding of marriage equality I am not advocating that we reinstate this as a principle. I had a lot of fun conversations with my wife about it this week. She was not advocating for it either. But the principles at play are quite thought-provoking to me. How do you address the unseen, unproven relational issues? Not just in marriage, but in all areas of life. Right? If you suspect that someone has offended you, or cheated you, misused you, what do you do with that? You can't prove it, but there's just something broken there. How do you take it to God and create time for reflection? How do we submit our relationships and let God work in them? Because what we see here, I think, at the bottom line is that God cares about the purity of our relationships. He wants us to bring them to him, creating space for the offender to reflect 
to find remorse, to confess the wrong, and then move forward in a renewed relationship. These three seemingly unrelated areas that are addressed in Numbers 5 all point us to the truth that God is holy, and if they were to have Him in their midst, living in their camp, their physical, ethical, and relational purity mattered. Even if no one else could see it, how we conduct our lives matters to God. So what about us today, right? We're not camped around the tabernacle. The presence of God isn't dwelling in our midst like that. But isn't the presence of God dwelling in our midst? Matthew chapter 1, Christmas story, right? Mary will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they are to call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is the first picture of Jesus we're given in Matthew's gospel. Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us. So now rather than at the tabernacle or at the temple, God is dwelling with us in bodily form. Of course, Jesus was only here on the planet for 33 years, about 2,000 years ago, and yet this indwelling presence of God remains with us today. Paul will summarize it very succinctly in 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Right? You now are the temple of God's Spirit. He dwells not with you, but in you. The Spirit of God isn't over the hill down in that tent. Take care as you approach it, right? The Spirit of God is in you. You are his temple. He dwells in you. And as such, God still cares about our physical, moral, and relational purity. Not just the seen, but the unseen. He dwells in you. What could there possibly be that he does not see? Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Here Jesus tells us in a very positive way, hey, God sees everything. You don't have to make a big show about how you pray, right? He says you can pray in the silence of your room. You can pray in the unseen corners of the hospital. God hears us and God sees us. But equally true is that when we think no one is watching when we think no one sees, when we step into the unseen sins that we think this won't hurt anyone, who could it possibly harm? God sees us. God knows. And these things do hurt us, and they hurt him, and they hurt others. The first five chapters of Numbers remind us of God's holiness. And the Israelites call to be holy as God dwells in their camps. But these same truths still remain today. As Peter wrote to the early church, he calls them, and you and I, to these same things. 1 Peter 1, he writes, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Just like the Israelites, you and I are called to live holy lives as God dwells with us. Peter reminds us that we are foreigners in this life. We are passing from here to there. And as we travel through the world, we represent God to the world. Does our physical, moral, relational purity, or lack thereof, represent God well? Because it matters. One commentator I read this week summarized the whole chapter in that. I could have just read this and we would have been done. But he said this, if God is holy, 
his people must also keep their camp free from defiling influences. If God is righteous, any form of moral injustice or unethical behavior is an offense to him. God's people must also be just. If God is faithful, any unfaithfulness on their part, either in the wider community or within the intimacies of marriage, is unacceptable to a God who never breaks his promise. If this was the case for the nation of Israel, as God dwelt in the middle of their camp, how much truer should it be for you and I today as the Spirit of God dwells inside each one of us. And so we need to stop and think about the unseen areas of our lives. Would you want these things to be unwrapped like a birthday gift in front of your family and friends? Could you stand before the tabernacle and take that drink declaring, Amen, let it be? Or are there things unseen by everyone else in your life that God sees, and he's inviting you to address today. Because here's the truth that we have, is that Jesus has already paid the price for our sins. Jesus has already redeemed us. We see Jesus meeting those who are physically impure. He met with the sinners of his day. He didn't condemn them, but he welcomed them to meet his loving grace and his forgiveness. And that invitation stands today. God sees the unseen, and he invites you to experience Jesus' forgiveness. It's not that we are called to look at the unseen and condemn ourselves. We are called to explore the unseen corners of our lives and bring them to Jesus, knowing that he covers them because he loves us. Will you pray with me this morning? Lord Jesus, we are a very gifted and making sure we appear good. The world sees us, they see our actions, they see our lives, they see the things that we've purchased and built around us, and we look presentable. We look holy at times. And yet our appearances are just the surface of what you call us to. So often we carry these unseen things We think that if no one can see them, they won't matter. They don't affect others. But God, you see them. You know them. And you're inviting us to bring them to you. That Jesus can cleanse us from all unrighteousness and sin. And so this morning, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come with your loving touch and begin to shine light into these corners of our lives that we would rather keep hidden and dark. That you would show us how you want to meet us in these moments and call us to walk more purely with you. So come Holy Spirit and speak to us today. We ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us?